Okay, welcome back, everyone. It's a pleasure to introduce uh, Sylvia Ganassi, um, who's going to give our final talk of this session. And her title is Self Similar Sets and Lipschitz Graphs. So over to you, Sylvia. All right. Thank you, Donna, Dahlia, and, and the others for the invitation. It's uh, it's been a uh, it's been a while that I have attended any one word. I burned out in 2020, I think. So it's uh, this is a great opportunity to, to be back. I think they are great. Uh, great type of events. So I'm very happy to be here. And as we were saying, very happy to be here in a very international day. And okay, so what I'm going to talk about is all a joint work with Blair Davy at Montana State University and Bobby Wilson at the University of Washington. And uh, which module of, some, module of uh, fixing, no, not fixing, but like continue to keep track of a couple of constants should be on their archive soon. So um, the first few slides should be not mind blowing for this audience, but I think for completeness, I'm gonna go through all of them anyway. So in summary measure theory, we talk about there is two main characters. There is rectifiable sets and pure rectifiable sets, which are kind of like uh, the protagonist and the main antagonist. The rectifiable sets look like lines almost at almost scales and location and pure rectifiable sets are almost never flat. We, we all know probably several categorization of these things, but I guess the way I like to explain to people that don't know what the pure rectifiable set is the most is that if you are inside the pure rectifiable sets, you see points of your sets everywhere. So in, that would be like points of radiation if we want. I'm not going to use any of this definition, but okay. So what the, what are the, the, the precise definition in... Uh, in writing, well, we know that the set is rectifiable if it's covered by countably many Lipschitz graphs. So many of you may probably know this definition with Lipschitz images, but as long as your measure is absolutely continuous with respect to Hausdorff measure, which it is in our case, since it's just the Hausdorff measure, re re you can replace Lipschitz images with Lipschitz graphs. And for today, I'm only gonna talk about, I'm only gonna focus on sets which have positive and finite measure. And of a, of a certain out of dimension, which is going to be mostly one in a second. And what's the definition of pure rectifiable set is that a pure rectifiable set does never see an ellipsis graph. So, okay, so by looking at the, um, at the definition of pure rectifiable sets, we see immediately that pure rectifiable sets don't see ellipsis graph at dimension one. So that at dimension one, the measure of the intersection is zero. A question that one may have, and the question that like, uh, yeah, this actually came up, I think, in 2020, is, okay, but what about a lower dimension? Like, do they see Lipschitz graph, maybe a, like some lower that the dimension, maybe it's one half, maybe, maybe it's close to one, maybe it's not. And one, so the question is, how large it really is the, the, the dimension? Is it really like, how bad, how bad a purifiable set? Are they bad at any intermediate dimension between zero and one, or are they like good? In, and when I say good, I mean Lipschitz in some lower dimension. And you know, as as often as often happens in life, when you like ask yourself a question, you start by by adapting the question to the most familiar to like a simpler setting. So, what is like a very nice Lipschitz graph? It's a line. So a first question, it could be, what about lines? And one could say, okay, but that's it. Like, I know that in the definition that I gave before, I mentioned that Lipschitz graphs and Lipschitz images are interchangeable. But what about a lower dimension? What about Lipschitz images? So for today, I plan of, of, of giving some partial answer to these three questions. So I'm going to start with the last two because they're somewhat less interesting than the first one. And then we spend most of the talk answering the first question. Also feel free to interrupt and ask any questions if you have, if you have any. Okay, so as a warm up, let's start, instead of considering in general Lipschitz graph, let's just start by considering lines. Okay, so as I was saying, when you have a problem about you, okay, what dimension lines, Lipschitz graph appear identifiable sets, well, you first restrict to your favorite Lipschitz graph, which is a line, and then you restrict to your favorite uh, pure rectifiable set, which in my case is the four corner counter set. I know that many of you are familiar with the set, but I will define it in the next slide anyway. So if you look at the four corner counter set, 
that the best you can do with a line is half the dimension. And so one can say, is this typical? Is this a worst case scenario? Is this a bad case scenario? Is it just like any option? And in fact, if you look at this construction, and I'm gonna I'm gonna go through all of like a proof by, by picture of this proposition in a second. Well, then you can you, you you can see that you can like modify the construction of the four corner counter set by constructing some purely rectifiable sets that has the, the, the dimension as close to one as you want. So the one half is not a good case. So now it's like is one half the back case? Well, also not because you can actually construct a, a pure rectifiable set that uh, that has a in, that that no lines see it. So for, for, for lines, the take-home method from this proposition is that the, the answer depends a lot on the structure of the set. Uh, these are all like, all the sets that I'm gonna say are pretty nice, Well, the last one is a little uglier, as we'll see. But okay, so the four content kind of set is gonna be, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna see a lot of it today. Um, so the four corner cut set, as you as as we all know, you just take the uh, the the unit square, you chop it in sixteen pieces, and you only keep the four corner ones, and then you keep repeating. So since uh, at every step you are copying four things of scale one quarter, the attractor of this is going to have dimension one. And what is you know why would the dimension if you try if you draw a line anywhere? you can, you know, the best you can do is always to take four out of the C16 square. And this is really not saying much more that if you throw a line at random in a, in a, in a square with the uh, N square points in a grid, you are like hit roughly square root of N of them. This is not much more than, than saying that. And you cannot do any better. Okay. So one example of a line, which is like, you know, my good line is like this line. And so this one is going to get out of the dimension because up here I get a square root of the squares. Okay, but then what prevents me to just taking some of them and moving them up here? So the only thing is that I want to do it, but I want to make sure to keep enough mass at the bottom. Otherwise, my attractor is going to end up being a line if I just focus everything on here. And how do we do that? Well, you just add it, if you take, you know, like this one is, is a six, so I have a six square, and I'm taking each of them of, uh, of side length one six, because I want my dimension to be one. But as long as I keep two of them anchored at the bottom, I'm gonna make sure that like some of the a, a constant proportion of the mass is here. So my set will remain uh, pure rectifiable, but the more I put here, then I'm gonna get as high as I want the, the, the dimension of, of my set intersect this line over here. Okay, and you know, this one was like, uh, this one was uh, GK here. I've used like K equals six. And I'm saying that the, the side length of this line is one over K. And so up here I have K minus two. And so my dimension is gonna go like log K over two over log K. What is something beautiful that we've used all along in all of these? Well, it's self-similarity, really. So if I want things to go bad, it's not a shocker that I have to abandon self-similarity. So some of you may, be, may recognize this picture for Matla, from Matila's book. This is the picture of a set whose tangent measures behave pretty poorly. Uh, and uh, And... So this is actually not the example that we have in our paper, but this one is a much nicer picture. And, uh, but the other one is much nicer computation. But the idea is that as the number of the circle increases and the curvature of, its, of, of each little circle increases, a line will, will be like, will stay with each circle less. And as the number of circle increases, it will hit less and less of them. So I don't, I don't, I don't aim to give you like a full proof of this, but just for an idea. Okay, so for lines, the situation is pretty wild. It could go any way. And again, here we have, um, I think an important rem remark is that things went wrong when I lost self-similarity. I lose self-similarity here because I need the number of circle to increase at every, at every, uh, at every scale. Um, 
Okay. What about Lipschitz images? As I said, these two answers were like somewhat uh, less interesting, so I'm not going to spend too much time on them. So if my set, if I assume my set to be Alford's regular, where I mean that uh, the the measure of a ball is roughly r to my to my dimension, then for all of those I can find a Lipschitz image which has intersection which has the, a dimension exactly one uh, with my pure rectifiable set, and you can just do this by using Peter John's Sally Charles theorem theorem where you just Having that for regularity just ensure that you can like bound the beta and then you, you can find the Lipschitz images doing that. So, okay, so for Lipschitz, for lines, the answer is very dependent on the thing. For images, for a large class of rectifiable sets, I mean, they are for regular, they're still very nice, but as you as you will see in a second, I'm, I'm about to make a pretty strong assumption on my rectifiable sets anyway. So, okay. So what about Lipschitz graph? So what we want to prove for Lipschitz graph is a theorem of this type. If you give me a small number, then I can give, I can, uh, well, this one is a, it's a specific statement for the four corner counter set. So let me go through the statement and then, so then if you give me an epsilon, then I can, I, I can give you a subset of the four corner counter set whose uh, um, whose intersection with the Lipschitz graph has high dimension. And of course, I have to pay for that. And I'm going to pay for this in the Lipschitz constant. Uh, this construction, as I said, the first thing that we... Oh, sorry. Zoom is asking me to sign in. Okay. I'm so sorry. This is uh, the university security things that they asked me to sign in a million times. Okay, but I didn't go anywhere, right? I'm still here. Okay, great. Uh, I'm sorry about that. It's just very annoying. Okay. Um, I guess I don't see this anymore. Okay. All right. Um, and okay. Um, so the first thing that we did was taking one specific set, the four corner counter set, and trying to build a construction on it. So I'm gonna be before going to the to the first general question, I'm gonna present this specific construction about the four corner counter set, and then we see what's good and what's bad about it. So how do you do this? Well, you start by selecting some squares. So the game for all of this construction is gonna be you give me an epsilon, I find a certain iteration to go deep enough, and then I repeat that every time that's going to be the game later so i can choose a subset and here i am looking at this i'm looking at this over right so the first obstacle for bringing a lipschitz graph is where am i defining it i need to find some frame where to define my lipschitz graph well why do we start with the four corner counter set well because we know that this has like a very nice property that if you project it to the line uh, this is, I'm, I'm sorry that none of my line is actually nine, but this is the uh, arc, the line with slope arc, arc, arc tan of, of one half, where my, where my four corner counter set projects as, a, as an interval. And then I'm just looking here and I'm trying to find things that don't overlap. So let me erase this beautiful frame here. So if I do the same here, I can also do that. And I, I can continue the process of zooming in at every step. And then once I've selected my squares, I just play a game of connecting the, the dots. So once I play this game, and of course here I'm not, you know, I have not gone, if I repeat this, what I'm going to show you, I'm going to repeat this iteration every time. This is not going to give me enough, you know, unless your epsilon was one, one quarter, this is not going to cover enough of my four corner counter set. But this is because depending on the on the epsilon I'm looking for, I have to go lower and lower in my like uh, in my like search for the for the for an appropriate subset. So if you do one and then you can do another, and then you can do another, you know, we can first of all we, we can see a little bit that maybe the, the Lipschitz constant is increasing as the slope of this 
lines is increasing, but also this is not enough. So I need to go down one further. I mean, or maybe many more. I'm only gonna show one further for tix reasons, <laughs> for sanity reason, I guess. And, uh, and you can continue doing this and if every time you get a lot of things. This is another example, more and more. What is the problem with all of those? Well, they're not very self-similar. I'm kind of zooming in, in the, like, in the last square to, to get more and more mass as I go. And this is a very ad hoc construction. I really used that my projection was one and it was exactly that. So how do we generalize this construction and to what type of set do we generalize this construction? Well, we restrict to a, a, to a class of, of rectifiable, of pure rectifiable set that arise as the attractors of other function system. So I assume that I don't have to go very slow with this definition. So I'm gonna go through this slide pretty quickly, but do please stop me if I say anything that like it's not clear. So I'm gonna have a, a, a classical IRD factor system with some scaling factor and some, uh, and some rotation. And you know, the attractor is the unique set that satisfies this. And I'm gonna have a similarity that Ada mentioned, which is uh, the usual. Uh, as long as my sets are nice enough, uh, which will, they, they will be, I'm gonna assume that the, that the similarity that the, the dimension will coincide with the other dimension. Was there a question? No, okay. Um, all right. Um, so, so, so again, um, and, you know, recovering was my example. Well, we all know that the four conic counter set, besides being a counter set, so being written as a duration, we can also write it as, a, as the, um, as the algorithm factor system by generated by, the, by this four function, which all have a common scalar function and the same rotation, which is kind of nice. Okay. Another thing that is going to be very useful is knowing the open set condition. When you know that your FS has satisfying open set condition, you know that things don't get squished with each other. And so you know that you have a good some type of good separation properties between the interiors, which is like good enough. And you also get alpha regularity, which if you're trying to find some subset and you want to know where the mass is, it's gonna come in very handy to have cell similarity and not for regularity to go find your mass where you want it. Um, and okay, so um, so I started with uh, um, pure rectifiable sets. Then I showed you a construction for the four connect counter set. And now I'm saying, okay, I can show you a different construction for all uh, attractor of other than, for all self similar sets of well-behaved. IFS, which I mean, it satisfies the open condition. Of course, I'm going to have to lose a little more in the constant. So here, like before, if you give me an epsilon, I can find the subset of my, of my attractor, which has high intersection with the Lipschitz graph. And now I'm going to have to pay a lot with the Lipschitz constants, which is going to go very big. Okay. Okay. Perfect. For the next 10 minutes. I just want to uh, uh, give you an idea of the proof of this, mostly with pictures of the four corner counter set <laughs> and a few words and a few words, uh, but hiding, you know, hiding all the computations under the rag. Though. Okay. So what is the strategy? Well, I was saying before, if you give me a set and I got to build the Lipschitz maps, I'm going to have to find some frame to do that. So the first, and maybe, I don't know if saying main is, is appropriate, but one of the big obstacles is finding a good direction. We also know that we're dealing with, pillar, oh, uh, I know that the one-dimensional attractor of an IFS, it doesn't need to be pure rectifiable, but if it's not, it means that the, all the points are aligned and your set is rectifiable, so I don't really have anything to prove in that case. This is why I did not exclude that in the statement. Uh, it's just a little uninteresting in that case. But okay, but, the first, but we know that if you're pure rectifiable, your projections are not that good. So that's an obstacle, is to find a projection which is large enough, living in a world where all the projections are very small, that is going to allow me to define a map. Well, and we just have, oh, I lost a piece of the slide. And 
well, we just have all the like all the heavy lifting is um finding so in broad strokes what the, what was the idea? Well, I want to find some direction where I have some large projection. Once I have it, I look, I put myself in the projection and I look up on my set and I want to find some subset. So I'm going to draw a picture here maybe. You know, once I am in this direction and I have my, my set everywhere upstairs, then if I, if I live here, I can look up and I can select a subset maybe of my set that is su such that it is like it has enough pieces but when I project them down to two, I'm going to have, a, they have enough space in between and I have also space between them because I'm just playing the game of connecting the dots again. And so I need the slopes to be bounded. And so if the slope are bounded within and, and between, then this is what I want. Now I can connect the, the dots between these pieces and I can like, and I can iterate this and find the ellipsis graph I can take the limit and I obtain my Lipschitz curve as long as I'm careful, you know, with the lip to uh, bounding the Lipschitz constant at every step. And of course, as we said, I have to pay a lot in the graph. So the main, so how do we find this direction? Well, the heavy lifting is really Matilas heavy lifting um, because uh, he has uh, some we we use some favar length lower bound for s sets and for the four i did not wrote i did not write the full statement so the favar length as many of us know is just the average of the length of the projections so if i know that i've come bound the favar length from below i know that i have at least one projection which is big enough so this is all i need and this is the proposition just adapted uh for the four corner counter set matilda has a much general proposition while bongers as a very ad hoc, very cute proof of this fact, in case you're curious. That's why I uh, put it here. So the Favar length for, of the nth generation of the four connect counter set, it's roughly one over n, which is going to be, which is going to turn out it to be enough. So once I have this lower bound, also, this is going to apply in case my IFS doesn't have any rotation. If my IFS has rotation, Things can get a little uglier as I go in generation, as I don't have, and um, we we can still handle that. It's just a little different, and since it's much uglier, I'm only gonna like touch upon very briefly it today. Okay, once I have my once I have my uh, my lower bound of our length, you give me an epsilon, then I find m large enough that my going down M generation is going to give me a number with, which is big enough. And having Alford's regularity and self-similarity tells me exactly how much measure I'm losing if I throw the piece, you know, exactly in the analysis sense. And now that I can find, uh, now that I have the, now that I found this, then I have a lower bound of our length and I can find one direction, which depends on M, but I fix them depending on your epsilon. So this is not going to depend on the generation in the future. And um, and, I can do, and I can do this one. Now, once I have the projection and I have a big enough subset, this is the construction is going to work the same. What happens in the rotational case, very briefly? Well, the first thing is doing a reduction. You have your set where it has all different rotation. And there is a paper of Bishop and Coders in 2009 about resonance of counter set, where if you have a, a, an IFS of dimension one, you can get the uniform sub IFS. I say uniform because I mean that they have the same scaling factor and the same rotation matrix, as long as you're willing to throw out a little bit of dimension. Since we plan on throwing out a little bit of dimension anyway, this is not a big ask for us. But Passing to the sub IFS generates a lot of constant. The Alford con the Alford regularity constants of your set changes once you take your subset. You can still find them, but it's a little bit of, of a sweaty following some proof of Martin and Matila. And uh, and the, the uh, many separation and other thing gets inherited by the sub IFS. And then there is also an argument, also adapted from from Bishop Perez, to find still some large projection. 
So I'm gonna hide here, you know, a lot of a lot of the of the thing in there. But both in the rotational case and the non-rotational case, now we have a, a, a direction. So uh, actually, sorry, let me just go. Okay, now they have a direction. What do I want to do? I want to construct a frame, and uh, I I, I want to construct a graph in this frame. And if I choose my sub my sub my sub by FS, which is like in both cases, our our Lipschitz graph is going to be given by another sub IFS. If you choose the the pieces careful enough so that they're all separated and not, then you can control their slope. So. Perfect. If I have two minutes, I'll just show you the picture of the four corner counter set. So in the four corner counter set, the proof tells you, hey, take the four corner counter set and depending on epsilon, go down enough generation and then just take half of them. Because having a constant proportion of them will be will be the thing that we need. So this is just a few examples of, of, of going, you know, I go one generation, I take half, I go two generation, I go three generation. And then how do I do I construct a thing once I'm here? Well, I connect the dots once again. So you get this, and then you get this one. Well, maybe this was not the right thing. I can go further down in the definition. This is like, this is if I've taken the first one, only half, this is what I would have in the second iteration. And this one, if I've taken four, this will be my second iteration. And I'm not as always. I'm, I don't have the 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 third tick thing because I ticked out by by this time. But the idea is that either way, all you gotta do in the end is bound the slope. So the 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 slope of this line are all gonna be easily to control because of the structure of the FS. And then you just want, gotta make sure that your the subset you choose is well separated enough so that you can control the slope of those to the limit. So. What are some what are some future direction? Well, you know we know that at dimension one, period rectifiable set of measure zero, not just the you know not dimension. So it would be very nice to know at which dimension you can get some quantitative result and some measure bound of this intersection. Another question is, of course, what about if I remove cell similarity? This is a structure for a very very special type of, of sub IFS. And I would expect that without the self similarity, the answer can go as wrong as you want. But I personally would expect that to be related to how non self similar you really are. And of course, another interesting thing, uh, uh, and there is some like re relevant work in this area by um, uh, Badger, uh, Naples, and Vellis uh, about intersection with older curves instead. And um, I, okay. And I think that I'm gonna stop here. Thank you. Got some some credit for the picture I've stolen from books. And uh, thank you. Hey, let's thanks, Sylvia.